Thank you. December 2018. Um, David Kalschmidt uh, from Grafana Labs was on the stage of KubeCon North America uh, to introduce uh, Grafana Loki, an open source solution to collect uh, and query logs uh, at scale. Now, fast forwarding uh, a year and a half later, uh, today Loki is generally available and is used by many companies and users uh, as a logging solution. Uh, to give you an example, um, at Grafana, uh, we have uh, a Loki cluster for our own internal uh, applications. Uh, we currently collect about 22-25 megabytes uh, of log per second for a total of 2 terabytes of log per day. Um, last week, uh, my colleague uh, Cyril uh, was tweeting about uh, some performance improvements uh, uh, we are introducing uh, in Loki. And uh, in our internal cluster, uh, this one, uh, we are currently seeing uh, about uh, 10 gigabytes per second of logs uh, processed uh, at query time. My name is Marco. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Grafana Labs. Uh, uh, I'm a Loki contributor and user, and I'm also uh, a Cortex maintainer. Uh, I'm mentioning Cortex. Uh, Cortex is a distributed storage uh, for metrics. Uh, I'm mentioning Cortex even if it's for metrics, while Loki is for logs, because uh, they both share the same architecture, and we have uh, a pretty good amount uh, of code base uh, shared between Cortex and Loki. Um, so even if I spend uh, uh, most of my time working on Cortex, uh, um, many of the changes we do uh, are actually used by Loki as well. In this talk, I'm going to give you uh, a brief introduction about uh, Loki, uh, a quick demo, and then the second part of the presentation will be a deep dive into the Loki architecture and storage. Now, the Typical problem uh, we have uh, uh, is uh, um, a distributed system composed by many applications uh, or microservices, uh, each one uh, logging tons of log, uh, and we want a cost-effective way to collect those log, store them, and then eventually query them back. Um, the way Loki works uh, is based on an agent uh, called Promptail, uh, which you install uh, on each node running your applications or services. And what Promptail does is tailing uh, the logs from the local file system and pushing those logs uh, to a central server, which is Loki. And then uh, you query back uh, your logs uh, using Grafana, or we also provide uh, a common line tool called uh, Log CLI. Now, to better understand Loki, we have to do a step back, and we need to understand the log anatomy in Loki. <coughs> so given a single log entry in Loki, uh, each log entry is composed by three components, a timestamp, a set of labels, and the log line, like the message you log from your own application. Now, the labels are <coughs> key value pairs. If you are familiar with Prometheus, uh, uh, they have the same exact syntax uh, of Prometheus, and they are metadata uh, you can attach uh, to each of your logs. Uh, like the application which is logging, uh, or the node information about where the application is running, and so on. And this metadata is uh, configured uh, through Promptail, the agent uh, which push the logs to Loki. Now, an important trade-off picked by Loki is that Loki does not index the content of the log. I mean, the message you log for um, your own application or the entire content uh, of the access log is not indexed by Loki. What we index, actually, is the timestamp and the set of labels. So what happens at query time is, given a time range uh, and your query, what we do is to filter down all the logs uh, by timestamp, by time range, uh, and the label matches, uh, and we use an index for this. And then, given the resulting logs, we do further scan the entire content in order to filter, now, filter them down uh, by the content. A group of logs with the same exact labels is a log stream. And the, a second trade-off picked by Loki is that given a single log stream, so a series of logs with the same exact labels, Loki requires that uh, the client, like Promptail, the agent, 
push desk logs already sorted by timestamp. This means that uh, uh, if Loki receive out of order logs uh, given a specific log stream, Loki reject desk logs. Um, this is not just a detail. Uh, this is actually a design decision uh, we picked uh, when we built Pocky. Because um, uh, in this way, we don't have to do any resorting, neither at ingestion time, when we receive the log, neither at query time. Because for each log stream, each log, each log stream is already sorted by timestamp. Now, don't get too much scared about uh, this, uh, um, let's say, constraint. Because uh, prompt the the, the, the the agent uh, can be configured uh, to actually fudge out of order time zone. So if for any reason your application logs uh, um, logs uh, with a timestamp which is out of order, uh, prompt can be optionally configured to fudge the timestamp which are out of order in order to not get any log rejected on the server side. And then uh, you query your logs. Now the query syntax uh, uh, is pretty similar to, at least the, the first part of the query syntax is pretty similar to, to Prometheus, because the query syntax is composed by a log selector and a filter expression. Now the log selector uh, is uh, um, used to filter the logs uh, by the labels. So given all the log streams that we do receive on the server side, when you query back your logs, uh, you can filter them by labels. And, and we use an index uh, to filter the logs by labels. In this case, we are filtering uh, where, uh, by application equal nginx or the instance, in this case IP, regex start with one. And then, uh, given the resulting logs, uh, you can further filtering down uh, the logs by the content, like the content of your log line, with the filter expression. And there's a second step filtering is done uh, doing a full scan of the logs. So there's no index. Which in other terms uh, means uh, we have basically built a distributed graph, if you think about it. Um, now prompt tail, uh, the agent uh, which again is used to ship the, log, the local logs uh, um, to, to Loki, does three things. The first one is uh, discover local logs. And then, for each log, like a log file, uh, you can configure a pipeline uh, to process those logs. Uh, you can attach label, uh, you can transform the logs, uh, you can drop logs you don't want to push to Loki, and so on. And then, at the end of this pipeline processing, we do push the logs to Loki. Prompt tail uh, is not the only way available to push logs to Loki. Uh, we have plugins for FluentBit, uh, FluentD. Uh, we also provide a Docker driver. We have an integration with syslogd. Um, but prompt tail, uh, uh, um, let's say it's the native way, and it's the way I'm going to um, show you in the next demo. Now, one of the <clears throat> most interesting things to me uh, about Promptail is that Promptail supports Prometheus-style service discovery, uh, which means uh, uh, we specifically support uh, the static service discovery and the Kubernetes service discovery. Now, the static service discovery is common to most of the logging solutions. Uh, you can configure Promptail to scrape the logs uh, from the log alpha system, configuring the file path of the logs. But if you run your applications on Kubernetes, you can actually use the Kubernetes service discovery. And the Kubernetes service discovery, uh, what does is uh, prompt tail um, keeps uh, a connection open with the Kubernetes API. And uh, we continuously discover all the pods running on the node where prompt tail is running. And in this way, um, <coughs> we can do two things. The first one, uh, we can automatically discover the pods uh, and we can scrape uh, all the logs uh, for each container running on each pod on that node. And the second thing is uh, you can configure prompt tail to dynamically inject uh, labels to each of your logs uh, based on the Kubernetes um, metadata, like the pod labels uh, or the node information in this case, we are attaching the name of the application, which, I don't know, could be the pod, a pod label. Uh, we can attach the node IP, the node name, and so on. Basically, any information, any metadata, um, which 
Prometheus Kubernetes Service Discovery support is also supported by Loki, because in practice, under the hood, we use the same service discovery from Prometheus. Um, there are three ways to run Loki. The first one, and the easiest one, is the so-called single binary mode. So Loki is just one binary, pretty much like Prometheus. Uh, you can download it, you can run it on your computer, uh, you can also run it uh, uh, with some little limitations uh, on multiple nodes, so in a little cluster, and uh, it's usually used for small installations, uh, and it's the way I'm going to run Loki in the demo. The second way <coughs> is the microservices way. So when you run Loki in the single binary, what we actually do is running multiple services within a single process. But what you can actually do is to pick each of those services and deploy them uh, separately in order to be able to horizontally scale each of the services which compose Loki. We are going to see the microservices architecture in the second half of the presentation. Uh, this is used uh, usually for large installations. It's the way, for example, we run Loki uh, at Grafana Labs. Uh, the third way uh, is to use Loki as a service. Uh, Grafana has uh, a cloud offer called Hosted Logs, which means we do run Loki for you and you configure from tail on your nodes. You push the logs uh, to Loki managed by Grafana and you get back uh, an endpoint, an HTTP endpoint, which you can use uh, in Grafana, the dashboarding tool, to uh, query back your logs. So as I mentioned previously, uh, I would like to give you uh, a quick demo. Uh, I'm going to use the single binary, which means uh, I'm going to run Loki on my laptop. Uh, I'm going to run uh, Promptail on my laptop as well. And uh, for this presentation, I downloaded the latest version from the GitHub release page, which is the 130. And I have two binaries on my computer, uh, Loki, the server, and Promptail, the agent. I built uh, a simple script uh, to generate fake logs, uh, just to use for this presentation. It logs 10 logs per second. Um, and the format is pretty similar to the GoLog uh, format. So it's timestamp equal a timestamp, level equal the log level, info or error, the application name, and the message, which is the, the message the application is logging. Then I configured Loki, the server, uh, to run with uh, a local, uh, the local file system as a storage so that everything runs on my laptop. And uh, I've also configured Promptail uh, to um, tail my log file where the bash script uh, is logging the fake logs. It's all, for each of those logs, uh, it's attaching uh, a static label called the type uh, equal demo, which I'm going to use later to easily query back the data. And uh, I'm going to parse uh, using a regex uh, the log line. So I'm picking the timestamp, the level, the application, and the message. <clears throat> and I'm setting the log timestamp uh, based on the content of the log line. Otherwise, by default, uh, is the time when from tail scrape the logs. I'm setting a couple of labels, the name of the application and the log level, which are inside my log line. And I replace the log line, removing the timestamp, the level, then the application, and just keeping the content of the message. So, I already have uh, this bash script uh, uh, generating some logs. I'm going to run Loki and I'm going to run Promptail. So at this point, uh, we have uh, Promptail, which tail this log file and push them, and push the logs to Loki. I also have uh, a local installation of Grafana, so I'm going to add uh, a new data source to Grafana to query back this data. So I select uh, the Loki data source, uh, and I configure the endpoint uh, of my local uh, Loki. It's running a Docker container. I save, it's green. So <clears throat> I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, Grafana. Grafana has a panel called Explore. Is it large enough? Maybe this is better. Um, the Explore can be used to, man to manually write queries, whether they are metrics uh, or logs. Uh, um, and it's a 
to me at least, uh, it's a convenient way uh, to experiment with your data before building dashboards. Um, what we care for this demo is the time range. Um, so let's pick uh, even the last five minutes of data. And uh, uh, we write the first query. So the, the queries are written in uh, a sort of Prometheus style um, query language. So basically, we select the labels of the logs we want to query. As I mentioned before, for all the logs, uh, I'm adding a, a label set called, uh, sorry, a label pair <laughs> called name e uh, type equal demo. So if I run uh, this query, uh, what I get uh, is the list of the entire logs uh, which my fake application, which is the bash script, uh, is generating. So on the top, uh, we see an histogram with uh, the logs uh, split by log level. In this case, the bash, is bash script is just generating logs with the info and error uh, level. And below, uh, we see the entire list of logs. Uh, we can uh, zoom into each single log line, and we can see the uh, label set for that specific log line. So we can see that the application which was logging this specific log uh, was the API application, um, the file name, uh, and the log level, and so on. Now, let's try to query data. Uh, let's say that uh, we just care about errors. Um, there's some issue in production, we want to check out what's happening, uh, so we can further filter down our logs uh, by the log level. Okay, so now we just got uh, the error logs. Um, and uh, uh, we can now start uh, um, to uh, filter further down the logs uh, based on the content. So if we look at the logs, uh, we can see there is uh, the logs, uh, the fake logs are view user, logout user, login user. They try to simulate like activities or update user. Uh, let's say we just care about uh, the authentications. Um, so we can look for the logins. Now, <coughs> we have further filtered down our logs, uh, just showing them con the one that contains the login. Or we can use a regular expression, and we can just look for login or logout. Here we are, and we have a list. Uh, you can pipe this filtering uh, in a, with hand conditions. Um, so for example, if we pipe, uh, user 82, we are going to see the login and logout for the user 82. Now, the second interesting thing of Loki is that it allows you to extract metrics from logs. So, so far we have filtered our logs and we are viewing our logs, mm -hmm. uh, but you, what you can actually do, switching uh, <clears throat> the button on the top uh, between uh, logs and metrics, uh, we can switch uh, to the metrics. Now, if you switch to the metrics, um, I'm going to simplify the query. Um, we can uh, compute uh, metrics using aggregating, uh, aggregation functions uh, using uh, actually the same aggregation functions uh, of Prometheus. So if you are familiar with Prometheus, uh, what we can do, for example, is to calculate, calculate the rate of logs per second calculated over a one minute time window. So we can apply the rate function with the one minute time window to our uh, logql expression. And what we see right now is, uh, maybe like this, is uh, for each log stream, and again, a log stream is a unique set of labels, we can see the rate of logs per second calculated as a one minute time window, so each data point uh, is one minute time window, the rate per second, and then it's, a, uh, it's a, a sliding window going back. And this is each single pixel uh, we see there. Um, now let's say we care the rate per second, uh, uh, not for each log stream, which in our case is the API application logging error level, the API application logging info level, and then we have backend application logging error, backend application logging info. Let's say we just care about uh, the split uh, between uh, the log levels. Uh, we can further aggregate the rate using a sum. So we can sum by 
by level of the rate. And what we get now is uh, the rate per second of logs uh, split by the log level. In the same way, we can build dashboards. So I'm going to build a new dashboard. I add a new panel. And in this panel, we are going to copy and paste our query. Last 15 minutes. OK. And this is, again, the same query before, but moved into uh, a, a dashboard. And we can add a second panel. But now we had the logs panel. The logs panel shows you uh, the content of the logs. So this is not uh, a metrics query. This is a log query. And let's say, for example, we are just interested the, into the errors. So we filter by error. And what we see here are metrics extracted from logs and the logs. And when you change the time window, like uh, you select uh, a portion uh, of your chart uh, and the time window, uh, the time range uh, get reduced, uh, the logs uh, update accordingly so that they are kept, kept uh, in sync. Good? Great. <coughs> do you want to ask a question now or do you want to prefer oh, to wait? Like as, you, as you wish. Uh, from, uh, my question is about uh, from tail, how it be behaves if the log file is rotated? I mean, OK, it follows the rotation. Follows? Sorry? Follows? Follows, follows, yeah. Uh, and how did uh, and how get informed about the new file descriptor? Oh, okay. Uh, we use uh, uh, we register uh, events uh, uh, on the file system. Okay. So it's done on file system level, which means that it's platform dependent. Yeah, but we do support multiple platforms. <laughs> One question: How that? <laughs> No. I have another half of the presentation. What do you think if we move all the questions uh, to the hand? Is it, because maybe some questions uh, like this one may be answered uh, in the second half. And then I will be available the entire night if you want. Uh, now, I'm trying, I can pick my microphone. I'm trying to give you uh, a better understanding of how Loki works. So, so far Loki has been a black box, right? Uh, I just told you, okay, there's this Loki server but I didn't tell you how it works, uh, how the storage works, and so on. So now I'm going to try to give you a sort of deep dive. Um, I will make it uh, as much simple as possible, or at least I will try. So when Promptail push the logs uh, to Loki, uh, the entry point uh, when you run Loki in the microservices mode, so when you run a cluster uh, for Loki, is the distributor. The distributor is a service which does three things. It validates the input logs, it shard and replicate the logs across a pool of ingesters. The ingester is another Loki component which keeps all the received log streams in memory and builds chunks of compressed logs. So for each log stream, it build a chunk. A chunk is like a compressed buffer, okay, um, of log received. And once a chunk is complete, which means it's full, uh, the ingester flush the chunk to a shared storage and offload the chunk from the memory. Otherwise, it will uh, go out of memory soon. On the read path, when you run a query using log CLI or Grafana, like we did before. The entry point is the query. The query is the third service of Loki. And what it does is, given the input uh, time range of the query and the query expression, <clears throat> it uh, fetches uh, the log, the chunks uh, for the log streams uh, matching the label selector in the query, both from the ingester and uh, the shared storage. Now, the ingester contains the latest received logs, <laughs> which have not been flushed to the storage yet, while the storage contains all the historical logs, right, uh, which have already been flushed uh, by the ingester. And then the querier um, received those chunks of data, which is still compressed, 
the querier decompresses the chunks containing the logs and does a scan, a full scan, of those logs in order to filter down the logs by the log line, which is not indexed. So each log stream, like this one or this one, over the time builds up a series of chunks. And each chunk contains the compressed logs for a specific time range. Like between the time one and time two, we have one chunk for each log stream. And then between the time t2 and t3, we have another chunk for each log stream, and so on. And if we look inside each chunk, each chunk contains uh, uh, all the compressed logs for one single um, log stream given a specific time range. So, since one locking requirement is that all the logs must be pushed to Loki already sorted, we don't need to index every single timestamp inside the chunk. We just need to index the minimum and maximum timestamp of the chunk. Because if you have the minimum timestamp, the maximum timestamp, and all the data inside is sorted, we can do a binary search inside in order to find the logs given a specific time range. So, the chunks, as I mentioned previously, are filled up in the ingested memory and they are flushed to the storage once they are complete. And the chunk is considered complete when the maximum chunk size in megabyte is reached or an idle time is reached. Think about uh, an application uh, which uh, is, uh, I don't know, uh, which you uh, decommission, uh, so it's stop logging. That log stream or the log stream generated by that application will not push logs anymore. At some point, the logs which are in memory in the ingester needs to be flushed to the storage. The reason why we need an idle time. We support several backends for the chunk storage, which again are the compressed logs. If you run on AWS, we support S3 or DynamoDB. Actually, S3 uh, is also an option picked by uh, people which is not running on AWS, but use uh, a storage which is S3 compatible. If you run on uh, Google, we support GCS and Bigtable. If you run on-premise or other clouds, we support Cassandra. Or if you run Loki on a single node, like I did in the demo before on my MacBook, we support also the file system, the local file system. Now, each single chunk is indexed using an inverted index. So each chunk is indexed, indexed by the label set, the minimum timestamp of the logs inside the chunk and the maximum timestamp. This index is used at query time by the queries in order to narrow down the chunks it needs uh, given a specific time range, input time range and query. And uh, we support a uh, few storages as well for the index. Uh, AWS DynamoDB, Google Bigtable, Cassandra again if you run on-premise or other clouds or if you run on one single node uh, like uh, the demo I gave you before uh, we support BoltDB which is integrated into Loki. Now if we get back to the original architecture uh, I hope now the shared storage uh, is no more a black box. Now we know that actually it's composed by two storages. The chunk storage which contains your uh, compressed logs and the index storage, which contain an inverted index, which index each chunk by the label set and the time range of each chunk. Now, um, previously I mentioned that uh, when Promptail pushed the logs to Loki, the entry point is the distributor. And I also mentioned that one of the things the distributor does is sharding. Since the ingesters need to keep all the logs in memory for a short time until we build up the, the chunk which is then flushed to the storage. Uh, if you have a high volume of logs, uh, you will probably need to horizontally scale those logs. The, sorry, those ingesters. So the distributor, given each single log received an input, compute a hash of the label set and given this hash picks one of the ingesters from the pool of available ingesters to which the specific log should be pushed. I know your next question, maybe. What happens if an ingester dies? So since the latest logs are kept in memory, if an ingester dies, 
the logs are lost. The replication is the solution to, let's say, protect uh, from this failure scenario. So Loki allows you to configure a replication factor, which we suggest to be three, which means for each single log stream uh, we do receive an input in the distributor, we compute the hash, and given that hash, we um, write that log to one, two, and three ingesters. So if an ingester dies, the log that have been pushed to ingester one have also been pushed to other two ingesters. In this case, uh, in the example, the number two and the number three. So try to stay with me. I want to talk about this one because uh, my boss uh, is a super fan of this one. And uh, I've became a super fan as well because it's a very flexible data structure we use for many things, including how the replication and sharding is built. So the replication and sharding is based on the ring. The ring is just a data structure, okay? Like any data, data structure. And uh, it's, it's distributed in, distributed in the sense that this data structure is shared across the pool of ingesters and uh, distributor, which means every time this data structure change, all, other, all the nodes within the cluster will get the updated data structure. Now, the hash I was talking before in Loki is a 32-bit hash. But to keep uh, this presentation simple, we are going to use a hash space uh, with the keys between 1 and 10. So let's say that we have our hash space, which is the number which our hash can assume. 32-bit in Loki, between 1 and 10 in this demo, in this presentation. When an ingester is started, it generates a random value. And the random value is uh, the value, the key, that the ingester picks uh, within a ring. A ring is just our space containing all the keys. So the ingester number one start, uh, it generates a random value, number two. And then the ingester number two start, it generates a number value six, uh, and then the ingester number three start and generate a random value nine. When the distributor compute a Nash our input uh, label set, the hash value is uh, within our key space. 32 bit in Loki 110 in this presentation. And what we do is uh, the distributor check if there's any ingester with the, with, uh, the same value of the hash. If there's no ingester with the hash which we computed the labels, what the distributor does is walking through the ring in order to find clockwise in order to find the first ingester, the first, the first healthy ingester <coughs> within the ring. And in this case, the log is pushed to the ingester number two. If you enable the replication, we don't stop at the first ingester we find. What we do is continue walking within the ring until we find three well, actually, two more ingesters if you have a replication factor of three. So in this case, it will continue to walk. You find the ingester number two, and then the three, and then the one. And that's how the replication and sharding is built. And that's actually how several other features are built. Several other features which require some sort of coordination are built within Loki. This data structure needs to be shared across the nodes of your Loki cluster. So, ah, we need another backend. Um, we support console, etcd, and we recently in introduced uh, gossip support, uh, which means we can build a peer-to-peer -peer network between, between all the Loki nodes, so that we, you don't need to have console or etcd uh, just to keep the ring data structure, which is a few kilobytes of data. Now, the good news is that we don't need the strong persistence. Uh, to give an example, we run lock in production uh, and we just run uh, one console instance in memory, so with, even without storing the data to disk, without any HA or stuff like this. Why? Because even if you lose console or etcd for a short time, and even if all the data inside is erased, when a new instance, which is of console or etcd startup, even if they're empty, all the nodes within Loki 
are able to reconstruct the ring, the data structure stored within console or etcd. The only downside is that if any change to the data structure will happen during the console or etcd downtime, the change will not be propagated to the other nodes. The change will be propagated as soon as the backend uh, is restarted. Uh, there would be much more I would like to talk about, but obviously uh, I don't want to give you further overload of information. Uh, we support caching um, in order to reduce uh, uh, the operations against the shared storage, both on the write path and the read path. Uh, Locky support multi-tenancy, which means uh, you can enable the multi-tenancy in order to have uh, um, locks uh, uh, fully isolated between uh, users. Um, this is the way we run uh, uh, our own uh, um, Locky as a service solution, uh, hosted locks. Uh, this is also the way single companies <coughs> use uh, when they have teams uh, and they want the team A to just be able to query the logs of the team A and uh, not exposing the logs of the applications of one single team to the entire company. But before leaving, there's one last thing I actually would like to talk about, which is uh, a new service uh, we introduced, or fairly new service we introduced, which is uh, an optional service uh, uh, you can put uh, in front of the queries and is used to speed up the query performances. And it's the query frontend. Now, the query frontend does two things. The first one is a first scheduling. Now, let me explain you the problem without the query frontend. So let's say we don't have the query frontend, uh, but you run locket scale, you have multiple query instances, and you have a load balancer in front of the query instances, so without the query frontend. What happens is the load balancer receives a query, and it does a round robin across the queries in the backend. So it receives one query, it goes to the query number one, second query, query number two, and so on, and it does a round robin. The problem is not every, every query put the same load on the system. There are queries uh, which can be executed in 100 milliseconds, which are queries which can scan a bunch of logs and may take 30 seconds to execute. The problem is that uh, if uh, uh, you have a pretty high traffic, at some point you may end up in, into a situation where your the load balancer um, send the query to a query which is already overloaded, but you have another query which is idle. The query front end introduce a queue, an in-memory queue. So when we send the query, the load balancer balance across multiple query front ends for high availability purpose, and the query front end pick put the query received an input into an internal queue and then the querier, when it's idle, picks another, que another query from the queue. In this way, uh, we can better distribute the workload across the, the, the queries. The second thing, which is built on top of the queue, is the parallelization. So let's say that you run a query, like uh, the one I used uh, at the very beginning of the presentation in the example, and you run this query for a large time range, like I want to see all the Nginx errors uh, uh, for the last uh, 24 hours. Now, if you have a pool of queries, uh, without the query front end, the query will be executed by one single query. So the other queries are unused. What the query front end does is picking this query with a large time range and uh, splitting the 24 hours time range query into 24 one hour queries. So we build, we put in the internal queue 24 queries, each one for one single one hour time range. And then the pool of queries will pick those queries to execute from the queue. We'll send back the result to the query front end. The query front end merge the results and returns back to the client like Grafana or log CLI the logs sorted by timestamp. That's pretty much all. Um, I've been very happy to be here. <laughs>